Ugh. Somewhere between filming my last two videos and this one, I came down with a cold. So if I sound or behave strangely in this video, that's why. I just took a test and it came back negative, so it's definitely just a cold. But no one ever talks about how much the common cold knocks you out. This cold sucks. I have tinnitus. Anyway, let's talk about Haruki Murakami's strangest novel, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. Before starting Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World, so many people told me that it's their favourite Murakami novel. And those same people also kept telling me that it's his strangest, his trippiest, his weirdest, whatever adjective you want to use. And it is. It's a really, really odd book, and I really, really enjoyed it. I'll say up front that Wind Up Bird Chronicle is still my personal favourite Murakami novel, but this is a really, really good one. Trying to explain what Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World is about is a very difficult task because it is so strange. I'll give it a go. This novel is separated into two narratives, Hard Boiled Wonderland and the End of the World. They are two entirely separate narratives in terms of their protagonists, their settings, even their genres. But given the fact that they are science fiction and fantasy stories and the fact that this is a very strange and trippy novel and the fact that both stories are in the first person, you know they must have something in common. There must be a narrative thread going through there somewhere. The first narrative is Hard Boiled Wonderland, and it occupies the odd-numbered chapters in this novel. And it tells the story of this nameless protagonist who's a 35-year-old man, and his job is something called a Calcutech. This is a science fiction story set in an alternate Tokyo, a nondescript time period, probably somewhere in the near future, and a Calcutech's job is to... <sighs> process and encrypt data. This is a world where data is very valuable, which it is. And these people, these Calcutex, are hired to use their own bodies, their own consciousness, to encrypt data. It's not clear, but it also is clear how this works. There are entire chapters pretty much dedicated to explaining it, but they don't always make sense. Translating it must have been an absolute nightmare. There's a lot of world building, but that world building doesn't always help with explaining things. It makes it feel as if it's grounded. It makes it feel as if Murakami knows what he's talking about, but how much you get all of the nuances and details of what a Calcutech is, is really up to you and maybe you're smarter than I am. But Calcutex also have a kind of nemesis, these people called Semiotex, who are basically Calcutex but evil, and they try to steal encrypted data. And so there's kind of a war going on between them. Calcutex kind of work for the government, or a government agency, and then Semiotex are kind of like an underground crime syndicate. When the novel begins, our protagonist is going up in a lift into this skyscraper. And there he meets a scientist who has hired him to do some data encryption. And this scientist is obsessed with sound. He's doing research on sound and how our sound organs have evolved and how we use sound and how sound can be manipulated or destroyed or used and weaponized and all sorts of things. Our Calcutech is hired to do some data encryption for him and along the way he learns a little bit about what this scientist does. But to get to the scientist at the very beginning, he has to travel through a closet in an office, and that takes him into this kind of cavern full of waterfalls, and then he hikes and hikes and hikes through this impossibly strange alternate world somehow, and then he arrives at the exact same office all over again, and this is part of the encryption, this is part of the hiding from the people that want to steal from you. And within this strange portal of caverns and waterfalls that he goes through are these strange creatures that are effectively Kappa, the Japanese Kappa demon. And you don't know why they're there, but they're there. The End of the World is the other narrative that occupies all of the even-numbered chapters, and that tells the story of a, again, nameless man who has wound up in a town at the end of the world, whatever that means. It's a kind of medieval town surrounded by an enormous, impenetrable wall. And this young man has ended up in this town, and he's given a job as a dream reader, where he has to sit in the library and read the dreams from the skulls of dead unicorns. His shadow was taken from him when he arrived at the town, and the shadow has a personality of its own, and our protagonist, over the course of this story, goes to meet up with his shadow, and he wishes to be reunited with it, 
and he's worried about his shadow and what will become of it. Both of these narratives have no proper nouns for any of their characters. Every character in this story is just given a title, like the scientist, or the librarian, or the chubby girl. This is my one big issue with this book, and I'm gonna address it now. It's an issue that a lot of us have with Murakami in general, is that he doesn't treat his female characters with an iota of respect. This is a big problem with Murakami. Sometimes it's how he writes his sex scenes, which are awkward, but that's not necessarily a problem. It's the way he treats his female characters. All the way through the hard-boiled Wonderland narrative, the scientist has a 17-year-old daughter who is unusually horny for our protagonist, who is just some ordinary bloke. But she's called the chubby girl. At the very beginning, the only thing we learn about her is the way that she looks, and our Calcutech protagonist is just describing her to us in incredible detail. But it's not just how he describes her, it's how he describes her through his own opinions of fat girls, and what he thinks of fat girls, and how she's unusual because she's fat, but also pretty. And he's worried, oh god, what does that mean? That might mean I end up sleeping with her, oh no. <laughs> it's so cringe and awful, and I hate it. Now, I like unlikable protagonists. One of my favorite anime of 2021 was Mushoku Tensei, which has a revolting, predatory protagonist. But the point of that is that he gets better and improves narratively. And if that were the case here, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But our Calcutech protagonist isn't likable or unlikable. He's a blank slate. He doesn't ever offer up opinions about other things or people or himself even. He mostly just goes to great lengths to be mean about this chubby girl, and talk about how he's confused that he's sometimes a bit horny for her. It's revolting. And then all the way through the book, she's called the chubby girl. Even if there are no other characters anywhere to be seen, where she could be called the girl, the granddaughter, because she's the scientist's granddaughter, the woman, the young woman, literally anything. But she's the chubby girl. She's always the chubby girl. It's embarrassing, and I hate it to my core. But it's Murakami. Anyway, I have to say, aside from that, I don't really have any complaints about this book, even though, as I was talking before, I made it seem like it was almost too confusing to comprehend. That's not a problem. Murakami's novels are almost always Kafkaesque in some way, they're almost always surreal in some way, but they make their own kind of sense. They have their own kind of dream logic attached to them. And this one does too. The world of Calcutex and Semiotex and data encryption, it all makes sense. Our protagonist exists in a world that is different from ours, it is an unclear and vague science fiction world that makes sense for its own narrative, and I really enjoyed that. I think I did slightly prefer the end of the world chapters. I liked the setting, I liked how mysterious it was. I liked Haruki Murakami's own twist on fantasy. I like the way that he builds this medieval walled city, and the characters in it, it actually felt very Neil Gaiman-esque. As the story goes on, there's this obsession with the forest, and a pond in the forest, and this really made me feel Neil Gaiman vibes, where the natural world of this place abides by its own laws, and they are laws of the author's own creation that make sense to him, and he has to make them make sense for us, and they do. It was very Neil Gaiman, and I really, really enjoyed it. I also enjoyed that protagonist. Again, another blank slate, but one with just enough verve and vigor to give us something, give us a bit of propulsion through the narrative. It is difficult to talk too much about these narratives without spoiling things. As I said, you know they're going to be linked in some way, but how they are linked turns out to be really gripping and fascinating. In the second half of this book, it becomes something of a thriller that then transforms again into like an anti-thriller, and I can't talk about any of it, and I don't really need to. I enjoyed the feeling of being a little bit lost in this world. It's been called Kafka-esque, but it's only Kafka-esque in the sense that it is strange and surreal. It doesn't have Kafka's philosophy. The Kafka-esque is used too often to describe things in a vague sense. But the Kafkaesque is really about the nonsensical and overcomplicated world of modern day bureaucracy. And this book isn't really about that, I guess. I guess you could argue that it is. Actually, yeah, maybe it is. The bureaucracy of the guy trying to get his shadow back and not understanding why his shadow was taken. The bureaucracy of the Calcutex job being overcomplicated and also vague and not really well described. Actually, thinking about it, it is pretty Kafkaesque. Huh. 
Haruki Murakami is known for creating narratives that are trippy and strange, and often glued to our real world. This one is him exploring the bounds of both science fiction and fantasy in the same work, in the same novel. And I really appreciate his interpretation of what those genres mean. I think it's really cool that if you say fantasy to Murakami, this is what he comes up with. This is what his mind creates. When you say science fiction, this is what he creates. It had that sense of, this is a world entirely devised by the creator. It is a blend of their own politics, philosophy, and imagination. It is bound by a genre, only so far as a genre does bind things, if that makes sense. And in so many ways, it really feels like someone said the phrase science fiction to Murakami, and then asked him to write a novel, and this is what he did. Hardboiled Wonderland and the End of the World is also one of his earlier novels. It was his fourth book after the Rat Trilogy, which ended with A Wild Sheep Chase, which is one of my favourite books of his. After that, he made this. And it really is an unshackled work. I love the fact that there is very little Murakami bingo in here. If you're unfamiliar with that, Murakami bingo is the fact that after a while, all of his books feel very samey because they have so many tropes that are so familiar to us. A thing disappears or a person disappears. There's a talking or a magical cat. There's a hole that goes to a weird place. There is a guy who's obsessed with jazz or running or both because he's basically Murakami. There are a lot of tropes that get repeated and recycled through his books, and it can be almost nauseating sometimes. This one doesn't really have much of that. Occasionally, the protagonist waxes lyrical about Murakami's favourite American novels, and jazz records, and Bob Dylan. But apart from that, there's not much Murakami bingo in here. This is his approach to science fiction and fantasy, and I really came to appreciate and enjoy how unshackled and strange and twisted it all is. It is weird and trippy, it makes its own kind of sense and you never feel lost, and it is Kafkaesque now that I think about it, which has made me happy. I'll stop there, my cold is making me dizzy. I'm going to challenge myself in 2022 to finally read 1Q84. Let's see how that goes. Subscribe for books.